Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for what you've already done in this service. We thank you, Lord, that you're touching people's hearts and lives. Lord, we just let faith rise, amen, for you to accomplish everything you want to do in our lives, Lord. We just celebrate you this morning and all that you are in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. And the Sunday school kids can be dismissed. They can go downstairs. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you all for being here. We have uh, Toby and Jody are out of town, Don and Jane, and some others are. It's summertime. You know, that's what happens. Praise the Lord. But it's great that all of you are here. Appreciate you being here. And, uh, praise God. It's great to, great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. God is good. I mentioned uh, just quickly in passing, I, I mentioned that we got the roof put on Friday. And uh, if you can check it out when you leave, you can see that it, rather than having individual uh, vents, there is a vent that runs nearly the continuous thing of the roof. So if you're looking up there and wondering what the heck's going on up there because it's flat on both ends and then there's this thing that's risen up a little higher down the middle, that's the vent. It's a continuous vent. So that's the way that... Uh, we had it done. It's, it, you get better circulation that way than the individual vents and so forth. So anyway, it's a good thing. They did a great job as far as I can tell. I'm not a roofer, but it uh, looks good to me. And we'll see if when it rains, praise the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. But we also had the money already for the, uh, for the siding. And I don't know exactly yet when the contractor is going to be able to do it. When I talked to their lawyer yesterday, or Friday, I should say, uh, she said it would be in the very near future. So I, I know... It'll, it'll be uh, within 90 days, I'm sure, and probably more like 30 or 45. So we get that done, and we're good to go, praise the Lord. And looking forward to that, and uh, we got the money for it, so it's all good. Praise the Lord. We don't have to take up offerings or beg or plead or ring necks or anything else. Praise the Lord. We just thank God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's all good in Jesus. Praise the Lord. I was, uh, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, you ever watch, watch the... Olympics and things, I, I've wondered, and I guess I'm just never going to understand how anybody comes in second in a biathlon. I mean, they've all got a gun. <laughs> right, it's part of the... You guys are really tough. For you. Okay, I met a microbiologist the other day, and he was much bigger than I expected. <laughs> microbiologist. But on a serious note, Sally had to take a driving test the other day, and, and it went surprisingly well. She got 9 out of 12. The other three managed to run to safety. <laughs> if I had 50 cents for every math test I failed, I'd now have $7.30. Okay. God's in a good mood. He's always happy, praise the Lord, and he says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So I'm into being happy at any price, praise the Lord. Amen. All right, so let's, uh, Peter, if you will, let's begin at, uh, appropriately, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Peter 1, verse 15 and 16, he says, But as he which calleth you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but when I first was in church and got saved and I would hear them talk about this, it used to freak me out because I knew by any kind of standard that I could manage, I wasn't holy. I knew he was holy, but I didn't feel I was holy. Anybody say amen to that? In fact, I was taught quite frequently by the church that I couldn't be holy. I wasn't holy. There was no way I was going to be holy. But anyway, he says, but as, how, why, how would he, why would he tell us to be holy if it wasn't possible for us to be holy? I know you're getting nervous now. You think we're going back somewhere that we haven't been for a while. But just bear with me, okay? So Matthew chapter 6, and we'll read verses 22 through 33 now, Peter. Matthew 6, verses 22 through 33. 
Thank the Lord. Yes. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon isn't money. Mammon is just a natural way of doing things. We've, it's always been referred to as money. It is money because money is what we use for business down here. But it's really just talking about the natural way of, of accomplishing things. So, Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what, oh, excuse me, no man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and the natural realm at the same time. In other words, you can't live by natural rules and think that you're going to get from God what you would get if you applied the spiritual laws, okay? So therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Now when he says Gentiles here, he's referring to unbelievers. So at, for all these things, every, everybody needs this stuff, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian or whatever you are. You've got to have stuff. You've got to have food. You've got to have clothes, right? So for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and that literally translates his way of doing things, and all these things then will be added to you. All right? Mark chapter 4, verse 26. So he says we need to seek God in the way God does things, not the way man does things, in order to get what it is God has for us. All right? Mark 4, 26 said, He said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. So we... Uh, in fact, if you go back, you don't have to repeat it, but Mark 4.14 says, The sower soweth the word. So the seed that he's talking about here is the word of God. Amen. Now, we sow the seed of the word, and the word of the kingdom, which is what the word is, amen, and you sow that into your life, and in, in those people that you come into contact with, praise the Lord, you sow it into your life, and you sow it into the lives of the people that you interact with. Amen. And then you go to bed. You rest in the power of the seed. Jesus is our rest, right? So the seed and the earth does everything else. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to even know how it works. You just have to know to sow. And then you can rest in the word. And it will produce as only it can. Amen. The farmers aren't trying to figure out this. You know, they, they plant it. They move on, they just work the fields, right? And they trust that the seed's going to produce what it is they planted. Amen? So one plants, the Bible says, another waters, but it's God that gives the increase. Amen? So in Matthew 6, 28, where we read just a, a, a moment ago, he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Well, how do they grow? They neither toil nor spin. And they're arrayed in more splendor, it says, than Solomon in all of his glory. So he's saying, take, an, take, a, take a lesson here from the lilies. They're not sweating it out. They're not wringing their hands about, you know, sunshine, rain, whatever. No, God just provides. It's part of the natural course of events. Amen. So because the power is in the seed, the lily is a symbol of resurrection life. That's why we always have lilies at Easter time, right? They're, they're kind of pointing us to the resurrection. Amen. And look, let's look at this in Solomon chapter 2, verse 2. Solomon 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Solomon 2. What, what's the book of Solomon? I've never heard of that. Psalm, I'm sorry. Psalm, Psalm. 
Song of Solomon, yeah. Okay, sorry. And here it's always Song of Solomon, so. What, two, verse two? Chapter two, verse two, yes. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Now we've talked about the parallels and the, and the metaphors and everything here in Song of Solomon, referring to us, to the church, and uh, Solomon being uh, a representative of Jesus. But he says, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So Solomon is describing his bride as a lily among thorns. Amen? Thorns are the symbol of the curse, right? When Adam failed and God cursed, you know, because of his unbelief, what, what happened? The earth began to bring forth thorns and thistles. Amen? In Sinai, where the law was given on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai literally means my thorns. Praise the Lord. Where the, where the law was given, the curse. Amen? We are cursed because of the law. The law is a good thing, but the problem with the law is it demands stuff from us that we can't give. Praise the Lord. And so when the bride is described as a lily among thorns, he's speaking of people who have resurrection life, people who are redeemed from the curse of Adam and from the curse of the law. All right? Because of the power of his resurrection life, we are without toil or spinning. That's why we are to rest in the finished work of Jesus. Amen. Are you still with me? Yeah. Amen. We are free from the curse. We've been delivered from the curse, from the consequences of our inability to keep the law. That's why he gives us grace. Amen. Amen. And he said his grace is sufficient. So for whatever our need is, right? We're free from the curse. Praise God. Amen. We've been clothed with Jesus. Amen. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Yes. Like a garment. Amen. Yes. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, yes. and that you put on the new man, yes. which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Praise the Lord. We are the righteousness of God. The scripture tells us. We are the sanctified of God. We are holy as he is holy. Amen. Romans 15, 16 says that we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you don't think you're holy, it's because you're looking at this mess. What's in you is holy. When you got born again, when you believed, you became holy. Your, your spirit was born again, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. Now, the Holy Spirit won't dwell in a place that's unholy. That's why you have to be born again for the Spirit to come. Now, we look at our lives and say, well, you screwed that up, and you got mad and cussed somebody or did this or did the other thing. And we think, okay, well, then you're not holy and you're busted. No, that's not the case. We don't want to be that way, but we know we fail sometimes, and we lose our tempers, and we do whatever it is we do that is... Not, uh, not connected, amen, to our holiness, to who we really are. But we are holy because he's declared us to be holy. We are righteous because he has made us righteous, amen. He became sin so that us sinners could become the righteousness of God with, without doing anything other than believing in the words that God has spoken, amen. And then saying them back, right? Doesn't it say believe in your heart and say with your mouth and you will be saved. Everything in the kingdom works that way. We thought it was just about going to heaven. No, everything works that way. Amen. So look, let's look at this quickly at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. This is the freedom. See, I mean, I, I love the Lord. I just hate religion because it, it, it just it keeps you in a stranglehold all the time. It's always pointing out your faults. I don't need that because I already know I've got them. In fact, I know some that you don't even know about. Praise the Lord. Amen. And you probably have some that nobody else knows about, but who cares? If God's accepting this, let's let God work it out. Let's let him deal with us, amen, in the way he wants to do it. So he says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, here's another one that will frighten you. Pete, have hold, be holy, in other words, or you're not going to see God. That's not comforting. And the scripture is supposed to edify and build up. Every scripture is supposed to edify us and build us up. So if we're reading that as though it's some kind of a bad thing, yeah. we're reading it wrong. Yeah. We're just not understanding it, right? So looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. 
Holiness comes by grace. So we need to look diligently lest we fail of the grace of God. So we, we get distracted from what God has done and make it about what we're doing again. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. How do we get defiled? By not believing who we are in Christ. Praise the Lord. All right. By grace, this all happens. Just the favor of God. All right. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. I've got a lot of scriptures this morning, but if I don't use all the scriptures, then it sounds like I'm just making stuff up because it suits my, you know, my, my lifestyle. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show exactly what God says about this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, uh, Hebrews 14, where he talks about uh, you won't see God if you're not really good. Amen. Those scriptures are not talking about seeing God in heaven. They're not talking about you won't see God, you know, in heaven. They're saying you won't see it here. You won't see the manifestation of God here. Praise the Lord. Amen. So it's about today. It's about every day that we should be able to see God. But if we don't believe that we are holy, if we don't believe that we are the righteousness of God, if we don't believe that what God has said about us is the final word, is the truth, then we don't see manifestations of God. We don't see God because we're not believing. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. All right, let's look at this then. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8. Praise the Lord. I mean, we're supposed to be the happiest people Right? The most contented people, the most at peace people, the, the most unanxious people there are. But we know we get just as freaked out as everybody else does. Why? Because we don't believe what God says. We believe what some religious person has dumped on us and thinking that this is what we got to do. And we, and we know that we don't do it all. So we figure we got something coming and it ain't good. Right? I mean, if you do wrong, you're going to get wrong. Praise the Lord. That's what just constantly drives us, amen, to despair and to distraction for that matter. But sanctify yourself, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and do them, for I am the Lord which sanctify you. Now, they're talking about the law, but if we bring this to, up to the New Covenant, we know everything in the Old Testament is a shadow or a type of what he's trying to tell us in the New Testament, where faith and grace come. But he says, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy. Because I'm the Lord your God. And you will keep my statutes. What are the statutes? His words. It's not the rules. It's not the laws. It's what he says we have to agree with, right? And do that. And I am the Lord. I'll sanctify you. I'll make you holy. Right? Praise the Lord. So set yourself, or, or in other words, position yourself in the same way that God sets himself. Position yourself the same way God positions himself. In faith. God's a God of faith. Everything he does is by faith. He looks on the chaos, the darkness, and he says, light, be. Yeah. Right? He, he sees there's nothing on the earth, and he just starts saying, plants, animals, morning, night, sun, stars, right? By faith, this all happens. It isn't God just using some weird force, you know, like Star Wars. He says it, and because he believes it to be, it is. It happens, praise the Lord. So we're to position ourselves the same way God positions himself. By faith. We say what we say and we say it by faith. That's the way God operates, amen. Fix yourself on what God says, amen. If you're fixed on what God says, the scripture says stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Just say what God says and all you've got to do is stand still. All you've got to do is rest and watch. Praise the Lord. So, again, who sees God? The pure in heart, right? The holy people, right? Amen. No mixture. And that's when you see God manifest. When there's no mixture. When there isn't serving two, trying to do both, right? Man, the world's way of doing things and God's way of doing things and trying to bring those two together and think that you're going to get a manifestation of God. It won't happen. It can't happen. It isn't the way it works. Amen? So holiness is being convinced that... Now listen to what I'm saying now, because I come from a church that was a holiness church, and many of you may have been the same way. And we know if you were there, and all religion is this way to some degree, but the holiness churches are even more that way, 
And it's all about your appearance, your, your actions, your yeah. words, your behavior. So if you, uh, for the women, if you cut your hair, oh, whoa, you got a problem. Because the angels are looking, waiting yeah. to snatch you right out of here probably. Yeah. If you do, I mean, we, uh, I'm not trying to be hateful to people who still believe that. I'm just saying that's where a lot of us came from. And so if you wear anything other than a dress, you, you're gender messing, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is no mixture. You can't, you can't live the law and grace at the same time and think that you're going to get anything from God. Amen? So holiness is not the way you look. Holiness isn't even really the way you act. Amen? Holiness is being convinced that what God says is what God's going to do. Amen? Now look, James chapter 1 and we'll read verses 5 through 8, Peter. James 1, 5 through 8. <clears throat> if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, nothing wavering, for, if he, that wa for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And this goes back to what we were reading in Matthew, mixture, and so on and so forth. So what he's saying here is being double-minded is demonstrating unholiness. Praise the Lord. I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Amen. But because there is an inconsistency, amen, between what the guy says and what he actually believes and does. That's unholiness. It isn't, it isn't, you know, because you got drunk. It isn't, and I'm, I'm not, you know, promoting anything. I'm just saying it isn't because you got mad and cussed somebody out. It isn't because you give somebody a, the high five a minus four fingers. You know, I mean, it isn't that. That is not what defines your holiness or lack of holiness. Amen. It's this inconsistency between what we say and what we actually believe. Praise the Lord. And what God is trying to say here is, in effect, if you are confessing or professing something and you don't think it, that God will do it, then don't think you're going to receive it. Praise the Lord. The truth is God can't give it if we don't believe for it. Because He is holy and He has to be true to what He has said in His Word. Otherwise, He wouldn't be holy. If he said one thing and then didn't do that thing, yeah. he would not be holy anymore. He'd be inconsistent. Yes. He'd be untruthful. Yes. Praise the Lord. Holiness isn't some mystical, you know, nebulous, uh, weird, spooky, cloudy presence. It's practical. And it's real. Amen. Holiness actually means one. Yes. Not the number, but one in the sense of being complete. Mm, wow. So... Holiness denotes the concept of being integrated. And integrated comes from the same word as integrity. Praise the Lord. This will mess with you. And God has integrity because what he says, what he does, and who he is are all the same. And that's exactly what holiness is. God always does what he says. Because he is one with himself. There's no division. There's no schisms. There's no paranoia. There's no, I'm up today and down tomorrow. No, he is just the same today, tomorrow, and forever. Has always been, will always be. Amen? So why is it important? Why is, what's, what makes that important to me in, in the way I make my confessions or my professions? Because unholiness or this impurity, this mixture, cannot remain in the presence of God. Amen. Because God is holy. Right? All right, let's look at this again. Leviticus again, Peter, uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. Leviticus 22, 1 through 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. I am the Lord. Say unto them, 
Whosoever he be of all your seed among your generations that goeth unto the holy things, which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. So if you come to the holy place and you're not clean or you're unholy, you're cut off. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, verse 9. Same chapter. They shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die. Therefore, if they profane it, I, the Lord, do sanctify them. So the people who died in that way, and we know it happened because there was a couple times when they, uh, you know, serpents and everything else, because they were arguing against what the, the Lord had said and so on and so forth. But the people that died in that way didn't die because God likes to kill people. Amen. They died because holiness and unholiness cannot exist in the same place. It, it, it's not like God come up with this plan. It's just the facts. It's just the reality. He didn't, he didn't have to do anything for this to happen. He's just warning them ahead of time. Look, holiness, unholiness, they don't, they don't coexist. They can't coexist. And so if you don't do what I'm telling you, not because I'm trying to give you a rule. I'm just trying to protect you. And if you don't do that, then you're going to die. Because they were not holy. The only way they were holy is because of God's giving them the, the, uh, the regimen which they would go through to be accepted as holy, which was the washing, the cleansing, the sacrifices, and everything else, right? So remember, Matthew 5 and 8, he says, the pure in heart will see God. Amen. Amen. Those who are impure cannot see God. Get, bringing it into a new covenant, into the New Testament, we're saying now, no, you're not going to die. You're just never going to see any manifestations of God. He, you're not going to die because of this because the law has already been dealt with. And this was from the law in Leviticus that he's talking about. So now he tells us in the new covenant, under grace, amen, you won't die. You just won't get any manifestation. You just won't see God. You won't see the, the manifestation of God being whatever that is, a healing, a deliverance, a financial breakthrough, relationship, whatever it might be. All right? So you see what he's telling us is we have to have the same integrity between what we say and what we believe. If you don't believe it, don't say it. Amen? Get some belief. Or I would, I would even venture to say you might just fake it for a while. Just say it till you do believe it. Yes. Just keep saying it and don't say something else. Amen. Because it's what's coming out of your mouth is what they're, what's being listened to. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thanks. Holiness is telling the truth. You go, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> I told a few of them. I stretched it a little bit. I didn't actually lie, but I mean, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Holiness is telling the truth. Not truth like we think that you tell a, you know, well, I had this story, because I'm lying every, more, every Sunday when I get up here and do these things like Sally took the drive. She didn't take a driving test. But I mean, it sounded a lot funnier if I said Sally did it than. To me, it was funnier. I mean, not to anybody else, but I'm just saying. But you see what I'm saying? The lying he's talking about, or the untruth, is this is the truth. The truth will set you free. This is the truth. We know. This is the only thing I know for sure is the truth. Right? So anytime I'm saying something that's not in agreement with this, I'm lying. I'm being unholy. Holiness is agreeing with the truth of God's word. It's telling the truth. Because God is holy, right? God cannot lie. He can't lie because all he has is truth. All he is is truth. Amen. And he's telling us, if you want this, the results that, that I have for you, you've got to say the truth. You've got to speak the truth. Because otherwise you're unholy. And don't think that you can get anything from God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. Jeremiah 29 Verses 11 through 13. So, I mean, this has become a, you know, the confessions or word of faith, whatever you want to call it. It's become a movement. But it, it's not supposed to be a separate organization or some. It's supposed to be the way God works. I mean, it's just how God does it. And, and if we're going to be imitators of God or the children of God, then we've got to do it his way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things. Because if you're going to try to win this thing on your own using natural, you're never going to get it. You're, you're just never going to possess the things that God has freely given to us. Amen? So, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. This is what 
Tim talks about this almost every Sunday he brings us up. And he should, because we forget. God's purpose for us is not to punish us, not to hurt us. His thoughts and his intents towards us are to give us peace, to give us joy, to, to do away with the evil, amen, and to give us the expected end, the healing, the deliverance, the whatever it is he's promised, right? So then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I'll listen to you, right? And the scripture says if, if we pray according to his will, which is the truth, then we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, the scripture says you have your petition. If you said what he said and, and you speak it back to him, he'll hear you. And if he hears you, and he does, then it's yours. Amen. Praise the Lord. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart or with a pure heart. Amen. Without the confliction here of the natural way of doing things and the spiritual way of doing things. Praise the Lord. We've got to be like Jacob. Remember Jacob? He's, uh, you know, running from his brother and, you know, on his way back, actually trying to, to, to bring a, a bribe to his brother so his brother won't kill him because he's expecting him to kill him because he stole the birthright and on and on and on. And so he lays down, he prays a prayer, and he's asking for God, and he lays down, and he puts his head on the rock, and, and he wakes up, and he says, uh, God was here, and I didn't know it. Wow. Praise the Lord. Wow. But what does he do as a result of that? He won't let go of God until he gets what God, what he asked God for. Wow. Praise the Lord. So we need to, first of all, we need to be aware that God is with us. That he'll never leave us or forsake us. And the other thing we need to do is get a hold of him. Amen. Yes. Like a bulldog and just not let go. Don't let go till you bless me. Thank you. Like, well, that's being kind of presumptuous. Apparently not. They were doing it under the old covenant. We could surely do it in the new covenant. I mean, if it was, if God was blessed by that, his pursuit of him and desire to have what God promised, surely it would be even greater, the reward here under the new covenant. Amen? Praise the Lord. I won't let you go till I see you. Hallelujah. Till I see a manifestation. Can you get a word from God and you, you begin to declare that. You don't stop declaring it. You, you're basically saying, I'm not letting go. Yeah. Not until I see a manifestation. Not till I see you. That's how it's supposed to work. We give up if it doesn't happen in a week, you know, or two weeks, and all of a sudden, well, I guess God doesn't. No, you, now you're undermining everything God's trying to get you. God, God cannot lie. It cannot be God. It has to be something in the process that we're going through, the way that we're operating. We have this mixture. I know what your word says, but I don't think you'll do it for me. Well, you don't believe. You're not telling the truth. And therefore, God cannot give you what it is he's promised. And then we go, see, told you he wouldn't do it for me. He's not a respecter of person. He'll do the same thing for anybody that will believe, that just won't give up, that just won't let, that won't let go. Amen? It's because God is holy that we can believe that he's going to fulfill what he promised. We can believe we receive according to his word, because his word is truth. And yet James said that if we doubt or don't believe, we're double-minded. We have no integrity. Unholy. Not integrated. Not one with who we really are. Am I making any sense at all? See, God is one. He's totally one with himself. But we struggle with that oneness in ourselves because we're we're so quickly drawn to the natural yes. to the last stupid thing I said or the last argument I got into or the last time I lost my temper or the last time I whatever you know just pick it it doesn't matter that's that's how we are so quick to define ourselves until we come to this oneness until we have this integrity we'll never get past that other stuff that has to come first, that our awareness of this oneness, because that's what drives us, that's what motivates us to stay in the truth yes. and not give up just because I didn't get it the first 30 days. Yes. Praise the Lord. Not holy. No integrity. Not integrated. It's an important point. I, I, I'm going to emphasize it again. Double-mindedness is the opposite of holiness and integrity. 
thinking both sides of the coin, the natural and the supernatural. It'd get you nothing. Praise the Lord. We, the scripture says we are a nation of kings and priests. We need to have faith in God's power to do what he's promised. God sees us as priests, as kings, right? And so as a nation of kings and priests, we need to have the faith in God's power to do what he promised. And I'll show you the, the here's the principle. Here's the, here's the type that he wants us to establish in reality, okay? And the type is Leviticus chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. This is under the Old Covenant, but we know, again, these things are all pointing to a, to a greater truth. So Leviticus 16, verses 18 and 19, and he said, He shall go out under the altar. Now he's talking about the priest under the Old Covenant. He'll go out under the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goats and put it upon the horns of the altar. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times. Seven, to seven is the divine number, right? It's a number of completion. Amen? Yep. And cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Amen? So under the old covenant, there was atoning power through animal sacrifices. And yet the priest had to believe that when he put the blood on the horns of the altar, God's power was great enough to atone for the sin. There was still belief that was necessary. He couldn't just be out there, you know, winking it. When he took that blood after seven times and he put the blood on the horns of the, 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 the horn, in Hebrew, represents power. That's why you had it on the altar. Amen. That's why the, the, the blast of the ram's horn. I mean, these things are all speaking of power. Amen. So in that culture, that, that represented power. So every time the high priest entered the holy place, he had to deal with God's power. I, I mean, I've read the books, uh, you know, uh, Ider Sham and, di and different ones who say they literally, and th these are traditions that are passed down, but they would literally, they keep the high priest up all night before the Day of Atonement. Because if he had a dream and it was sexual or it was deviant in some way, he would have been undefiled, he, or he would have been defiled, amen, and unclean. So they, they keep him awake so he wouldn't fall asleep and think, or... You know, anything that would happen. And they tie a rope around his leg, and around his ankle. So when he went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, if he was unholy, he'd be dead. And they'd have to, they couldn't go in because they weren't supposed to be there, right? They hadn't gone through the whole ritual of washings and all the rest of the stuff. So they'd tie a rope around him in case he wasn't holy. He's not going to be in there where God is. He's going to die. So they'd pull him, they'd drag him out. That was the only way they could get him out of there. You see what I'm saying? So he had to believe. It was more than just going through the ritual of, here's the things that we do as high priest. No, you had to still had to believe that when you put that blood, when you sprinkled that blood, God was going to respond in a positive way. Amen? You had to have faith in order for the atonement to take place. So every time the high priest entered the holy place, he had to deal with God's power. He had to be holy. In other words, he had to believe. Now, they had all the other rituals, but the point was he had to believe. That was, that's, the, that's the truth that's trying to come out of this shadow, this, yes. this yes. Old Testament uh, kind of picture, right? Now, look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27. So he had to believe that the blood of those slain animals that he was now sprinkling on the horns of the altar and then taking it in and sprinkling it on the mercy seat, he had to believe that this was going to work. He had to believe that God would honor that blood, that God would recognize that blood and make atonement, right? So who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and this is talking about Jesus now, those other priests under the old covenant, I just told you, they had to go through all kinds of stuff to deal with their own sin before they could ever come out there and try to deal with anybody else's sin. Well, Jesus didn't have to because he didn't have any sin. So that's who needeth not daily. He didn't have to daily deal with his sin because he had none as the way the high priest had to, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Again, speaking of Jesus, Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. Who 
whom God has set forth, again, talking about Jesus, to be a propitiation or a mercy seat, amen, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God or by the goodness of God. So his blood, Jesus' blood, still has power. Praise the Lord. God says to us, listen to me. I received the animal sacrifices the priest brought to me. The reason I did when, was when my power connected with them, it was so potent that it atoned for the sins of three million Jews, three million Israelites on the Day of Atonement. Because one man believed and did what God said. What happened? Three million people are spared the wrath of God for another year. Because he believed. Not because of the ritual. The ritual was important because it was part of the, the function of the church. But the, the reality was if he didn't believe, it wouldn't matter what he did. The fact that he believed is what God honored. Amen? Praise God. So his blood, it still has power. Amen. When God's power connected with their faith, it was so potent that the whole of Israel was spared, was delivered, was saved. 1 Peter 1, 18. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as ye now know, excuse me, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So you weren't, you weren't redeemed by stuff, Amen. Silver, gold, whatever. From your wrong speaking. Amen. Received by tradition or religion from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We were redeemed not by the other stuff. We were redeemed by one thing. Faith in the blood of Jesus. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. Praise God. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, he not only was the one offering, he was the offering. So Christ become the high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, talking about us, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more, if that worked for the Jews under the old covenant, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. See, what we need as much as anything is a purging of our conscience so we're not constantly thinking of ourselves as being natural people. We are spirits. We just happen to live in a body. Yes. And the body doesn't define us. Amen. It's just a vehicle. Yeah. It's the thing that makes us legal on the earth. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's why God had to come in the flesh. He had, he had a body. He gave man dominion on the earth. So man, it had to be man that redeemed us from man's fall. Yeah. So God couldn't just come down here and do it because he had already given his word that this place belongs to men. Amen. They have Dominion. So God had to come as a man in order to redeem us back from the fall of man. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, and then purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So you're not, it isn't any more about do, 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 do. That sounded awkward. It isn't what we're doing. Amen. It's what we're believing. And, and the more you believe, the better you'll do. 
to be quite honest with you. Praise the Lord. But if you don't get the, the believing right, it doesn't matter what you're doing, then it's just it's dead works. Praise God. All right, John 1, 29. So the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God. This is where John baptizes him in the Jordan, right? He sees Jesus coming unto him, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. Now those high priests, that the blood that they were sprinkling could deal with three million people, but it was only temporary. It was only good for a year until the following day of atonement the next year, right? But how much greater, it says, was the blood of Jesus. John said, This is the Lamb of God, not the Lamb that you brought in from the field. Amen. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not three million people for a year, but the sins of the world forever, if they will believe. Hello, oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Not the Lamb of man. Not something man brought. Amen. The Lamb of God. And that's why the scripture says, right, when the blood was accepted... He could go boldly into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the mercy seat and know that they had atonement for another year. And that's why the scripture tells us, because of this, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive from God. Because God has accepted the sacrifice. He's saying, now you're holy, you're righteous, you're, you're, you're accepted. Forever. Not just for another year. And for everything you've done, for anything you've done. And in fact, what you might do. Because it's the past, present, and future sins. And as it's been said many times, if you don't believe that, all of your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross. You hadn't even been born yet, praise the Lord. So don't give me that stuff about, well, it's just what you did before you got saved. No, it's everything that you could have done, will do, and may do in the future. Praise the Lord. It's all under the blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hmm. So we enter into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because we know the blood of Jesus has cleansed us and made us acceptable to God. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5, verses 26 and 27, Peter. Now here's another one of those little scriptures that pop up and you go, oh, okay, so what's this all about? <laughs> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself. And I was talking about the church, yeah. us, the believers, individually and collectively. So he's going to, he makes it holy. How does he make it holy? Sanctified. And he cleanses it. He makes it holy. He cleanses it with the washing of water by the word. That's how you wash. Amen. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Praise the Lord. So what's the washing of the water? Why, why do we need to wash in the word again? We're already cleansed. Amen. Through it, right? It was by the word that we got saved. We had to be sanctified. We had to be cleansed in order to be accepted, right? So what, what's this other thing? The first use of the word is for cleansing. Amen? Like the priest had to wash and uh, go through all of these rituals that we now kind of use as baptismals. But they had all these ceremonial washings and everything else. He had to, he had to cleanse himself and everything in order to be able to come into the presence of God. Right? That's the first one. So the first use of the word, the Bible, is for cleansing. Amen? And the second is for appropriating what God promised. Because first of all, if you're not cleansed, you can't even get into the presence of God. So you get into the presence of God, and then how do you get what it is you need? By the washing of the water of the word. By saying the word back. What does he say? My word comes down like rain out of heaven. And he said... If it comes back to me, in other words, if somebody will agree to this and say it back, profess it, confess it, it won't come back void. In other words, it has to produce whatever I send it to produce. If it can find somebody, soil, if that word, that seed comes down and it finds soil that is accepting of it, it will produce after its own kind. It can't do anything else. You don't need to know. You don't have to figure it out. You just have to take the seed, take the word, amen, and let it grow in you. And the way you do that, you water it by professing it and confessing it, amen, and it will produce. It has to produce. Now, every year, just from a natural perspective, and I'm not a farmer, believe me, the closest thing I ever got to that was baling hay and walking beans. But, I mean, I've been around it a little bit, and I know that the farmers, they plant the seed. They know what that seed's going to do. That's why they plant it. 
Now, they depend on water. They depend on rain, right? But the seed, is the, the seed produces what the seed is. They don't plant soybeans and, go, and you know, wring their hands for three months going, oh, my God, I hope radishes don't come up. <laughs> if a radish comes up, they're pulling it because it'll be in the way of the thing that they planted, right? The radish had to come from someplace besides the seed that they sowed. See, the devil is always trying to sow into your expected harvest. Even in the last days, the scripture says, in the last days, when we have this great harvest, we don't have to worry about who is and who isn't. See, the angels will separate the tares from the wheat. They know who believed and who didn't believe, who accepted and who didn't accept. We don't have to argue that with people because they're in a different denomination or this or that or the other thing. It's all in God's hands. We just love them and believe that God's going to bless them. And he will. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So look at again. Through verse, did I say 31? Okay, let's read Leviticus 16, verses 23 through 31, Peter. Leviticus again, chapter 16, verses 23 through 31. Again, now this is the priesthood under the old covenant. But it's a type for us. So, uh, I'll start at 22. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. Now, this goat is the uh, scapegoat, where we get the, the expression, the scapegoat. The scapegoat is where they put the sins on him and send him out into the wilderness. Yeah. Never see him again. Yeah. God's takes our sins and casts them as far as the east is from the west, never to be seen again. That's what the goat represented, okay? So then Aaron, who was the high priest, he comes into the tabernacle of the congregation afterwards and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth after his burnt offering and the burnt offering for the people. Now, he's been, he has been uh, defiled, you might say, by this goat. And that's why he's taking off his garments and washing again, okay? So he was sanctified when he came in. He was holy. He was washed. He was pure when he came in. But by the dealing with the sin, now he's got some issues, and so he washes again. This is the point that he's trying to make here. We come to God boldly, right, by the, by the blood of Jesus. We've been washed. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So we've been washed, and we come into the presence of God. Now what are we going to do that we're here? We've been accepted. We use the word. We wash with the water of the word. We say by the word of God what it is we're expecting or what it is we want or what it is we need, and God supplies it. Okay? And that's what we're, that's what we're looking at here. He shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, put on his garments, come forth, offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people, and the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes, again, here's what I kind of got ahead of, and bathe his flesh in the water and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought to, in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn it in the fire of skins and their flesh and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh, and afterward he shall come into the camp. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month and on the tenth day of the month you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Do no work. What's he saying? Once you've done this, relax. Rest. Yes. Yes. You sow the seed, and then you just wait. And just keep saying what you sowed. Amen. And he, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath. Praise the Lord. Amen. So God is saying to us through this verse, you've done what you're supposed to do. Now tell me what you want. You've accepted Christ. You've believed You've come boldly to the throne of grace. Now tell me what it is you're looking for. Tell me what you need. Tell me what you want. But do it by the washing of the water of the word. Everything is right between you and God. Present your request. 
Make your request known, right? Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. Praise God. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Be careful for nothing. What did he say in the very beginning? The lilies don't toil. They don't spin. The birds aren't wringing their hands about where their next meal's coming from. Oh. Right? Don't freak out. Don't fret how, how it's going to be resolved, how it's going to get taken care of. <laughs> Give it to God. <clears throat> sow it to the Lord. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known. Yeah. Here's what he's saying. Yeah. Thank me while you're asking me. Yeah. That's faith. That's showing God that I'm thanking you, Lord, right now. I just asked, but I'm thanking you right now because it's as good as mine. It may take a year. It may take six months. It may, I don't know how long. It doesn't matter. Amen. I know I've got my petition. Yeah. I've got it. I've got it by faith, and it will manifest. I'm going to see God in this because I'm believing. Believe, and you will see God. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Wash yourself in the word by speaking his will based on his promises. See, we, here's the deal. We can live in a continual state of oneness with God. And the way we can do it is because of the atonement of Jesus. The at one of Jesus. He was at one with God. What did he give us? He gave us at one or atonement. However you want to divide it up is saying the same thing. I have given you oneness with God. I have given you integrity with God so that you can get whatsoever you ask for if thou canst believe. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We can live in that continual state. Praise God. Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10. I think this is the last scripture. Hebrews 10, 12 through 23. Hebrews 10, 12 through 23. Praise the Lord. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are holy. You're perfect as far as God's concerned. Amen? Where, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. After the old covenant. In the covenant that we're now in, he says, I'm going to put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is... There's no more offering for sin. In other words, you don't need any more sin offerings. It was done. It's all over with. It's been taken care of. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way. Not through all the ritual. Just by the blood of Jesus and the washing of the water and the word. Praise God. He has consecrated for us, or separated, set it aside just for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Here's the bottom line. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. He that wavers is double-minded, cannot receive from God, right? For he is faithful that promised. Yes. Be holy, for I am holy. Yeah. Believe, because I can't lie. Have faith in the faithful. He's faithful that promised. Praise God. God is the God of holiness. Be ye holy as he is holy. Only believe. Amen. And nothing shall be impossible to you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see the manifestation of God over and over and over in their life. Yes. We were created to operate the way God does. Yes. Seek first the kingdom of God, yes. His way of doing things, yes. and all these things will be added to you. Yes. The way God does it is through words of faith. Saying only what the scripture says. Never deviating 
from what, the, what God has already spoken to us, we speak back to Him. And if you, can, if, you can't, if you can't say what God says, shut the hell up. Right? I mean, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just, we've talked about this before. If you're not going to say what anything else is coming out of your mouth, that's, com that's coming from hell and it's going right back. So just, if you can't say what God says, shut the hell up. Amen. Because that, whatever else is coming out is not coming from God. Are you with me? Yes. See, God, he, he paid such a, a horrible price for us to have this. And then for us to screw around with a bunch of religious ritual and crap and think that that's impressing God somehow, he's, he doesn't even look on that. He's not the least bit interested in it. He'd rather see us in our humanity, with our flaws, trusting him, than being the most pristine, perfect, you know, uh, self-righteous dorks on the planet. He, he's not interested in that. Because unless it's from Him, unless it's by faith, it, doesn't, it, de it never manifests. It never happens. <laughs> why, did he, why does God not want to share His glory? It, it isn't that He doesn't want to share His glory. He just wants us to understand that the glory is a gift to the righteous, to those who believe. It isn't something you can earn. He won't let you earn it. You, you cannot make God a debtor. He will not be indebted to anybody. You can't outgive Him. Praise the Lord. What blesses God is faith. And faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So say what He says or just keep quiet until you can. I mean, you got. I, so I tell you, I got to bite my lip a lot of times. You get a pain here, you get this thing yeah. there. You got somebody gets in your face, you know, and, and you want to just be. Back in the day. Nathan B.C., right, Tim? Yeah. yeah. He still lingers out there. Right. Praise the Lord. But I can't get what it is. I might get some momentary personal satisfaction from that, but oh, is it expensive. It ain't worth it. I'm going to say what God said and get what God said and let them worry about the other details. Praise the Lord. You can't, you can't be a blessing without being blessed. And God Amen. wants to bless you so that those blessings can flow right through you to others. Amen? Amen. Please, just, you know, this isn't a ritual. It, it, it isn't some dogmatic thing that we just do by rote, you know, or redundancy. You, you do it because it's the truth. Amen? It doesn't take you but one time to get electrocuted to know that when they say don't touch the bare wire, yeah, right. hey, they're not just screwing around with you. They're not trying to deprive you of something. They're telling you that really hurts. That'll mess you up. Amen? Amen. That's why I've said, never trust an electrician with no eyebrows. <laughs> I'm saying, praise God. Amen. Do it God's way and it'll work every time takes a little discipline. That's where the discipline comes in. It isn't about being perfect. It's disciplining yourself to just say what he says. Agree with what he says. And you'll see God. Praise the Lord. You'll see the manifestations of God in your life on a daily basis. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Please. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate your patience. God wants you so blessed. You, you have no idea how much he wants to bless you. Praise God. He wants to just pour out the blessings of heaven on your life and have you experience and have you seeing and experiencing God every day of your life. And then, I promise you then, you can share God with other people that way. Amen. If, you've, if, if, you, if you've struggled with the verbiage, you know, the language of it, get a manifestation. You don't have to say sick him. I mean, it just shows up, right? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Love all of you. Appreciate you. Trust the Lord. Say what he says and watch him show up. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.